what can go in the worm box, what you can feed them, and what you can't. You can feed them almost everything. I talked a little bit at the, at the picnic table. Even things like meat, there's no problem. Cheese, dairy products, no problem. They love it, you know? And if you got a good tight box, nobody else is getting in there, and no problem. But if you made bacon and the grease was left in the pan, do not give it to them, you know? If you got oil that went rancid, not for there. Because basically worms breathe through their skin and the oil coats them and they smother. Okay. Likewise, I might be wrong, but I just I intuitively would not like empty my popcorn bowl with the salt's all on the bottom into the <laughs> bin. You know? Because that salt is gonna kill life at least and it's probably hard in the worms. Finally, strong detergents and stuff, I intuitively think they're too strong. It's gonna at least kill life, and the bin totally depends on microbial life. You know? That's about it. Eggshells, no problem. Um, some people grind them up, you know, they eventually break down. I don't worry about it, you know. I just throw everything in there. Citrus, all that stuff, it's all fine. Um, a little bit of grit is real good. Some fine grit, some rock dust to be perfect because they have gizzards. And they can, they really appreciate that grit, you know. 65% um, moisture is pretty ideal. You know, 75, they'll make do with it. Okay, that was my little, I, I realized we hadn't covered that part. You know, you're, you're, you're putting out this tea on a regular basis, and we, we did. We, we cut their fungicides uh, 65 to 75 percent, and we cut their, their chemical fertilization uh, 94 percent, I believe. And, uh, but then how do you get to hold the biology? Well, if you're making great compost, and you can make a lot of compost and use it in a big volume, you're continuously holding lots of biology. But what I started trying to figure out, okay, so I made, I made potting soil that was based on compost, about 47% by volume of the potting soil was compost. And I was able to, you know, make amazing transplants and uh, suppress diseases and all that stuff. But it weighed too much. And then the average decent sized grower can't afford an inch of compost. Uh, Five tons to the acre is the thickness of a dime. Thickness of a dime, right? So, you know, they can't they can't afford that inch. So it's like, how do you deliver the biology and get it to stay like compost, but do it super light in some sort of concentrate? And how do you get stuff like compost tea? Even compost tea lasts for maybe a week or so. Then this then the sunlight and other things are happening. Stuff gets washed off. You know, populations decrease, especially in the root zone. How do you get it to stick around? And that's when I came to, I kept trying all these new substrates. And that's when I got the biomass charcoal. And that's, that's the next section we're going to go into is biochar. So biochar, I didn't have my little drawing, but okay. I'll go get it. Go get it, because I realized I didn't say something here. So okay. I can easily get to. I will confess that I, some, of these, some of these parts came with a kit I bought from a company called Alaska Bounty. This better pump and um, this diffuser came with a kit I bought. This here pump is available in Walmart for 10 bucks. I once I got home and went, it didn't work. I never exchanged it so I lost my 10 bucks, you know. So check it out at the store, okay. Um, likewise, you know, if you can't find this, try the better pet stores. You might be able to find it. But if you can't, then you just get those diffuser stones that go in aquariums and get it as many as you can fit, you know, get the connecting pieces and make a circle as you, best you can in the bottom of your thing. Yeah. Um, like I said, the whole thing probably costs less than 20 bucks per part. Well, actually, I take that back. These things can range up to 15 to 20 on the road. What own. is that thing called? The heater? This is a um, heater, Just aquarium, a heater. Heater. aquarium heater. Aquarium. Yeah. Um, and they, I know they now have a submersible ones. That'd be easier. You wouldn't have to worry about it getting, you know, I don't want this to drop down in the water. Mm -hmm. so That'll you might regulate get itself to yes. 70. Yes. Well, you have to set it, but it's got a setting on there. Yeah. What about the, uh, this one? What is that? Okay. John actually made this. This is a John Nilsson <laughs> artifact. <laughs> Um, he made it for me, for me, for my bit, for my um, compost process. It is simply screen, non-metallic screen, put together with wire. You know, um, and why he did this is we used to use these finer bags you could buy, but the holes were too big, too small, and the protozoa couldn't get through them. Nematodes and protozoa couldn't get through them, and that's something we didn't cover. If you buy from Charlie Clark, and it works well, which it didn't for us last year, I have to confess, but if you get it to work well. You can buy compost tea from him that has beneficial nematodes in it. You brew it, you put it out. John helped um, Mountaineer Country Club to do that. And they saved $6,000 on soil-based chemical insecticides. They stopped using all soil-based chemical insecticides. 
There's a huge array of things that eat turf. And the beneficial nematodes, you can wipe out flea beetles, cutworms, Japanese beetles. You won't control Japanese beetles because they fly in, but you'll wipe out your population. Um, all kinds of soil pests will be controlled by the beneficial nematodes. And so you can, they can find Charlie Clark online, right? No. No? Uh, um, he's a golf course superintendent and he manages like eight courses, so he doesn't even, it's hard to even get him on the phone. Uh huh. But he, he makes the compost tea kits. I can get it from him because I've been buying okay, them. Okay, so, so you probably have to get it from me. Contact John. Yeah. yeah. No, it's too, not fine enough, I don't think. I think you, the paint bag, they say, works pretty good. Yeah, yeah. paint, paint bags strainer, work. Yeah. Yeah, the the fishing net would be too, too, big, too big of holes. The compost would just come out everywhere. Oh. I think Lowe's, you know, had these paint bags, paint strainers. Yeah, well, they didn't have them yesterday the down here. Yeah. Yeah. The holes, can't, the holes don't yeah, want to be any smaller than this. They don't want to be smaller than that size. You, you can use the paint strainer for nut milk. So we've kind of went through the compost tea continued here the tank mix spray mix mister spreader stickers foods and now we're going to go into biochar applications not biochar production because that's like a whole nother day easily but um so how do you deliver the biology and get it to stick around right so compost is one way but you need a lot of compost every year in a backyard gardening situation if you can make a pile that big and make some casting you're probably doing pretty good. But as you get to bigger and bigger acreage, how do you supply in it? Compost, you know, the effects are still present maybe five to ten years, but then it, it breaks down and oxidizes and is gone. Whereas biochar, it's well made, half-life is a thousand years. So biochar, you're making it a pretty high temperature if you're doing it right. About 450 degrees Celsius like 1200 degrees Fahrenheit, right? So really good biochar is made at that higher temperature. And what it is, it's deader than a doornail when it gets done. There's no, there's no doubt about it at that temperature. You're sterilized everything. But it's huge pore space. It's actually what they call fractal in nature. It's pores within pores within pores. So um, a gram of well-made biochar could be the, soft, the internal surface area could be two tennis balls. So you think about that much surface area carrying that much biology. And the biochar is better than compost in that it, it's more recalcitrant, it doesn't break down. It's sort of like skyscrapers. It's like how many people can you fit on this much area if it's just a surface versus if this was in Manhattan there was a skyscraper up 80 stories or something, you know. It's just that's what biochar is, that humongous set of um, condominiums for organisms. But a so, skyscraper in a scientific, a, a science fiction dystopia. Yeah. <laughs> because really what's great is these microbes, you know, they live in a very, very intense world. If there's not 1,100 nitrogen exchanges in a minute, there's a lot of things out there want to eat the other microbe. So if the microbes can find these homes, they can do their good work and not get eaten, they can flourish. Yeah. So it's not just that they're in a skyscraper, but they're in this, just imagine, you know, the science fiction story where there's all the terrible androids and the, you know whatever out there that are going to wipe you out and you're in the skyscraper and they can't get in yeah they can't get in so i, I was trying to draw poor spaces and stuff here but uh <laughs> the idea is that it's a safe harbor so inside these poor spaces is water and nutrients because if the char sits outside long enough or we load it with all the things that's so back to the synergy right now right so so they can have their home and then they move out and interact with plants. So now say you did dump a high salt fertilizer and you wiped out all the biology in between. Then after that leaches out, the, the critters move back out again. So it's this long-term delivery system, this long-term substrate that, that charcoal does. And so one of the best steps to do that would be to make your great worm castings or your great compost and blend it with, char with biochar. And uh, this guy Christoph Steiner is pretty famous worldwide for biochar. He traveled the world and did a bunch of research. He was at the University of Georgia, and I was talking with him one day. He wanted to know what I was doing because I make a bio inoculant. And I couldn't tell much about the bio inoculant. I said, well, why don't you just blend it with some compost? I mean, you got all the research, though. Just do that and show how much more nitrogen is held 
So he put it in a chicken manure compost system at 20% by volume, and he, hold, he held 60% more nitrogen. So right there, shows you what the biochar will do. It holds the nitrogen, and it holds the biology, and holds the water. And it was the basis of a huge civilization in the Amazon. When the first Spaniards came up the Amazon, they said that the agriculture- they actually came down the Amazon. Down the Amazon. They said the agriculture was unlike you know, anything they'd seen. It was on par with anything anywhere in Europe. That's the sophistication of the agriculture. And huge populations in the Amazon jungle. You know? Yeah. It huge. wasn't a jungle then, though. It wasn't. It was huge, humongous areas of farmland. And um, the next Spaniards came up like 60 years later, and because the first Spaniards brought all these diseases, they, they had wiped out a civilization. And that's, that's a fact. They, they figured that out not too many years ago. And the Smithsonian had to reverse its statement about it, and now there's a, 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 a soil sample in the Smithsonian called Terra Preta, Black Earth. And it showed that the, that the natives back then did do slashing, and they, but they didn't burn. They made charcoal. So they, they slashed, got the fire really going, covered it with dirt, made charcoal, put that in the ground, and now the ground held nutrients instead of leaching away so fast. And these archaeologists who figured this out by flying over areas and see these perfect pockets of land and these high uh, roads that were built up found out, wait, let's go see where the roads go. And where the roads go, the soil was beautiful. Ten feet away, it was just crap. Well, it's so, actually, it's it's specific to to the Amazon. It's, it's aluminum and iron oxides that just like repel water. So that's why the trees have to recycle everything. You know? and, and they just made it so that the water then came in. And they also basically, people probably know the mid, midden pile theory of, of agriculture and stuff, how agriculture probably started from people like realizing what was grown in the dumps where they threw their, the food they didn't eat that they gathered. Well, the speculation is that the Amerindians Indians were doing that too, but they were including charcoal in it. And they, we don't know, maybe they were what's worth thinking about, maybe they were purpose making compost, but either way, they found the remains of animals and all kinds of other organic waste mixed with the charcoal. And that's what makes the terra preta. Yeah, clay char shards, little pieces of clay, all this stuff. A million pieces they made pot shards to give drainage. A million pieces per acre. A thousand pieces per square foot, basically. I'm sorry, 45,000 pieces per acre. Basically a thousand pieces per square foot. A thousand pieces of charcoal per square foot. No, of, of pot, pot, shards. pot shards. Yeah. You know? So, so um, what clay, certain clays also have the ability to house the microbes? And yes, as a matter of fact, you go back to our beginning step with the compost, uh -huh. the Lukis did recommend 10 to 20 percent clay, fine clay, in their compost production to hold more biology. Like the pyramid clay, which is absorbing Not but also nutritive? Not until the uh, end. That's what John's tweak of it is. Oh, yeah, see, I, what oh, I do okay. is I wait and I put it in at the end. Once you get really good, you can put it in early, but it just, if you, if you do you it too sure early, you you'll get smother heat. the pile yeah. and kill okay. it. Yeah.